All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by James Van Stratton. He's a lead analyst at CryptoSlate, where he conducts in-depth structured research on Bitcoin, layer one tokens and central bank digital currencies and macroeconomics. He's passionate about data, technology and trend spotting. And as a tech and liberty maximalist, James hails Bitcoin as the 21st century's paramount invention. Love to talk about that invention. I always say discovery, but uh, let's talk about that. Uh, welcome, man. Thank you for having me. Look for we were meant to do this a couple of months ago, so finally uh, it's happened. And I'm very happy to be on here. Yeah, so man. Thank you for having me. I'm happy too, and I think a lot a lot has happened that uh, that we can talk about. Uh, so yes. uh, maybe it was just meant to be. So uh, so yeah. so we are here. Um, for, yeah. First, before before we dive into like the market, I just wanted to ask you first: How did you discover Bitcoin, and what made you go like all into it? It was back in 2017. Um, I actually uh, graduated from university. Uh, I went straight into a media agency. And one of my friends or my colleagues at the time um, wasn't doing so much working, but was sitting in the corner trading. Um, so I, I gravitated towards him. Um, he was a very strange bloke, I'm not going to lie, but no, he's one of my best friends now. Um, and the 24 seven volatility, um, really hooked me, um, and seeing these games, I'm like, I've never seen anything like this before. Mm. Um, and then it took, uh, the bear market. Okay. Then I obviously bought the exact top in December, 2017, um, lost everything, bear market, had to learn or understand what the hell was going on. And then I had a good understanding by then. And then definitely but before COVID, COVID was that turning point being like, okay, um, not everything that they're telling us is true. In August of 2019, um, September 2019, around then, uh, they, the Federal Reserve put interest rates up slightly, not a lot, a couple of percentage points. And the, the repo market uh, seized, it froze up. And uh, everyone on Twitter was going or people were saying, oh, they need to inject loads of liquidity and cash and all of this. And lo and behold, uh, six, seven months later was COVID, which printed 40% of all the money supply. Um, so I'm not saying uh, as a conspiracy theorist or anything, but um, as, a, as a Gen Z, um, I have a very different way of looking at the world compared to a boomer or millennial. And um, I think all of these events have shaped me and definitely have now shaped me to being here. Yeah. So was this anything that, that was within your background or were these just things that you were looking at? Like, for example, the money printing, something that also came to me very late, um, just age-wise, like to understand, you know, if you create more units of the currency, devalues yeah. all the existing ones, you know, like it's now so logical. But was this something that you followed already or was it like this specific event that made you go it, into it, I've always been quite money orientated. I've always been, I was a saver beforehand and I tried to think of how, many, how I could accrue more, more money that way, but obviously in fiat, not in Bitcoin. Um, so I kind of understood when I say understood money, but I had that kind of Bitcoin mentality beforehand, uh, but I've been in data. Um, and stuff that I can't understand or I have a uncertainty about makes me want to understand it and research about it. So that curiosity made me want to go down that rabbit hole just, just on the base of what is going on really. Um, because the Federal Reserve and the monetary system is one of the most complicated things um, known in human existence. And to understand each nuance really made me understand what is going on and all right, if they're benefit, benefiting from this, how can I benefit from it? Yeah. So that's uh, that's how you saw Bitcoin. And, and you just mentioned like saving. Do you see Bitcoin as an investment or, or more as a savings tool? Um, I definitely saw it as an investing tool at the beginning. And uh, as conviction grows and you understand it more, it definitely becomes a savings tool. Um, so every month I will allocate a certain percentage towards Bitcoin. I've become more, uh, less of a Bitcoin maximist. Um, so I will have a, a percentage share that uh, I will allocate to trading or investing 
but the ultimate goal is to accrue as much Bitcoin as possible. So you want that bigger percentage share of the 21 million Bitcoin. Um, so that, yeah, that's the final goal, but there are different ways in terms of saving and investing, but ultimately getting to your total Bitcoin allocation. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting because that sounds like a way more conscious choice as to, you know, how you're trying to grow your wealth as opposed to, you know, a lot of people currently are investing, but they, they are not really sure why they are doing it, right? Like they are doing it because, you know, all the other people are doing it. Um, and they're, they're competing with people who are doing it full time as their job. Right. And so, uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's a good nuance, right. That you specifically say like, okay, this is what I do for saving. This is what I do for trading. Uh, I, uh, in the beginning when I discovered Bitcoin, I also did like, uh, I think three months of like day trading. And at one point I remember laying in bed and I just had, was almost like hallucinating. Like I saw all the charts and the, and the things like I had insomnia about it. And then I thought, no, I'm way too emotional to, to be mm -hmm. a trader. So for, for me, it's just a saving, savings tool. But I like what you said, you know, like the eventual goal is to just have more of that finite supply. Um, know and taking a bit of risk in in getting there and of, it, it is of course not wrong as long i think you know it's a conscious approach then you're way more aware of what you're doing yeah it, it, it had to work out in terms of percentages how much had to go into cold storage how much had to go into investing how much had to go in terms of um spending on my my existence um but no i worked out on uh, obviously i'm in data so i had to work out if i was just going to buy and hold would that give me um, an increase in exposure to Bitcoin or would that have a decrease? And I worked out if I put this amount in cold storage and this amount into investing and trading, um, I, you can't win every trade, but I knew there was that percentage that I knew that would come out ahead. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's the, the mentality I've had. Nice. And so we had, uh, we had the halving a few, uh, a few months ago where, uh, you know the new the new daily supply of bitcoin gets uh, gets cut in half can you share a bit about where we are now in the cycle like the period after the halving is usually a very important period where yeah. the market kind of settles in yeah i think the halving is a extremely bullish catalyst long term but extremely bearish short term so what we've seen is the huge amounts of fees so obviously miners get their uh, revenue from fees or block rewards and block rewards get cut in half so the fees of the uncertainty and the uncertainty around fees um, actually went away because we had that the launch of runes and that was great for like a week and just like anything with inscriptions ordinals they come and go so you can't rely on them as a steady source of income um, and they disappeared and then what we see now and what I called was a 20% correction post halving off the hash rate. And what we're seeing now is a, a continued minor capitulation. Uh, this is the old miners, all the old equipment that can't stay on because they're not profitable. Those miners are switched off. Um, and we're now in a place where I think the hash rate is at 16, 17% off the all time high. Uh, I still think we have quite a bit more to go. And um, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts because where we are now um, compared to just after the halving is it was expected like this hash rate drawdown, um, the fees disappearing isn't unusual um, for this halving, like this kind of halving cycle. Um, so I expected it, but it then kind of weighs on sentiment, which weighs on the Bitcoin price. And that's why we're kind of in this low of this $60,000 region. Uh, we went to 56,500 on May the 1st, um, which was 11 days after the halving. Um, and I think that's also due to a profit taking from the all-time high pre-halving, which has never happened before. So in December, I tweeted that we would Bitcoin hit an all-time high before the halving, which has never happened. And then I think once we hit the all-time high in March, uh, which obviously came from the ETF inflows, there was that constant profit taking and then the correction continued and continued. 
and then you have that minor capitulation with it. So it's this whole sentiment driven thing. Um, but if we're now, and sorry, one of your questions was where we're in this cycle, uh, I think this is epoch five. Yeah. Um, no epoch has been positive this point after a halving other than epoch one. So it shows how hard it is to generate positive returns after a halving cycle. Um, and then we'll get, so you'll be in this consolidation region or a bit lower than the halving start where we started, I think 64, 63. Um, but it's a continuation of other cycles. So there's nothing different. Um, or if we're measuring it from the cycle low, I think we're about 250, 280% higher. That's above previous cycles. Again, from the cycle time high or above previous cycles. So yes, price may not be like amazing, but it's perfectly in line with other cycles. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature fold for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally. Only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet that's easy to use. With their mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a microSD card and is built with 100% open source software and hardware. You can get $10 off a Foundation Passport with code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah, eventually, you know, if you zoom out enough, it, it is a continuous uptrend, right? Uh, yes. I, I think in general that is... Um... What we what we all I want to say have to, have to learn. That's probably the biggest signal, you know, that it just keeps going on, um, you know, the, the protocol. But then also the adoption of which I think price is kind of like a proxy. Yeah, I genuinely think the hardest thing about my job is being in the space twenty four seven, twenty four seven, monitoring the price. Yeah. Um, because it really, really makes it that much harder to zoom out and be like, yeah, Bitcoin's going to go to this, but all the chop and consolidation and the drops makes it because you're, you're there and you know when it's going to happen. You've got to find a narrative to every drop, um, but you can't. So yeah, that's, that's the hard part. Yeah. Do you really think that's necessary? Like that's what I see when people tweet about it, like, okay, today the Bitcoin price went down because of X, Y, Z and... <laughs> No, I don't know. I feel a bit distant, distance from that. Like it's just, you know, the, the, the chaos of adoption or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the chaos of adoption. Remember the 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 currency, the underlying currency is inflating at God knows how many percent. Um, so the true value of the sixty thousand dollars is uh, is wrong. The the value's wrong. The numbers wrong. Um, so yeah, it makes no sense really. So like one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, but if you're actually comparing it to the fiat value, yeah, it, it's barbaric actually. Yeah, I saw a tweet. I don't know by who. I think, or, or maybe it's Bitcoin BTC fair value. Uh, like someone has this Bitcoin fair value um, equation. I could not explain it right now, but he said like Bitcoin fair value is like two hundred twenty eight thousand dollars or something. So there's like a seventy something percent. Uh, yeah, the, the fair value, the fair value can be monitored different ways from uh, the network value or uh, in percentage of gold's value. Mm. So, um, but yeah, um, you can come up with many different valuations on Bitcoin's fair value. Yeah, um, and, and especially on network adoption as well. So what what do you think about um, 
like these new ETFs, Bitcoin ETFs that launched in other countries like Hong Kong, etc. Is that is that something we can expect something from, or is that just like a drop in the ocean compared to uh, drop in the states? ocean? A absolutely irrelevant. Um, the US is the biggest financial capitals market in the world. Um, the reason that I was so bullish pre halving was because of the ETFs, uh, because they were in the US and I don't see Canada and Europe have had, Canada have had the spot Bitcoin ETF for years, I think since 2021. Mm. Europe have had these ETP products for years. There's demand, but no serious demand. Um, so yeah, Hong Kong, the UK, Australia. Yeah, I wouldn't expect any um, growth or any um, big numbers coming out from any of these markets. Yeah. And we are seeing that uh, Mount Gox is getting ready to begin repayments, which I think wasn't really covered that well. You know, people are saying like, oh, Mount Gox is going to dump Bitcoin, blah, blah. But I, I, there's some confusion, but maybe you can clear it up. Like, are they going to repay people like in, in Bitcoin or is it in dollars? And then like this old price that I that I saw. But also to add to that, you know, U.S. government is selling Bitcoin. German government is selling Bitcoin. Everyone's is selling Bitcoin. Yeah. Everyone. Fascinating. No. Um, what, what's the impact of this? So I think this is the 77th time someone's announced that Mangox is selling Bitcoin. So <laughs> um, you have to excuse me if I don't know the specific details of this one. But I think it's the, the, the redemptions are going to come in July. But from my um, understanding, there's 145,000 or so Bitcoin in this Mt. Gox balance account. And these people have been in it for over 10 years now, essentially hodlers. And yeah. they also bought Bitcoin definitely after, um, and they've been probably buying it since. So they're, they're, they know the score, they know Bitcoin. Um, so they're not selling all at once. Uh, Bitcoin's obviously gone down 20% since the all time high. I wouldn't want to sell that much Bitcoin um, from that drawdown. I'd wait to go back to an all time high. So the price suppression is actually a really good thing. Um, but it, they will be staggered selling. It, it doesn't work that everyone sells with one go. It, everyone's different. Everyone has different. There will be sellers and there will be buyers. Um, but if people were worried about 145,000 Bitcoin, I'd be more worried essentially that minor balances hold 700,000 Bitcoin and they're drawing those down or short term holders, an entity that have held Bitcoin for less than 155 days who are extremely erratic or in short term price movements, they hold over 2 million Bitcoin. So like it, it's these narratives. I think this, the sell off actually happened before the news came out, meaning insiders and whales were selling beforehand or the market was adjusting to it. Um, but again, we're, we are above 60,000. We've barely dropped below 60,000, um, since March, February, March. Um, so it, it's just unbelievable. Um, so yeah, extremely bullish yeah. on that. I think this is, um, contradicting view. Uh, but I share it with you. you just the fact that it's still 60,000, that, that is, 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 I think amazing. J just that we, that it's very steady also at 60,000, you know, like that lots of people know what this is. I, uh, I think like last week I tweeted, uh, this, this hodl wave by unchained, if I remember correctly, I think like 65% of Bitcoin have not moved in, in two yeah. plus, two plus years. One, one year. So 65% of the supply hasn't moved. Yeah. Hmm. All right. One, 70 one yeah. 70 Yeah. 70% was the all time high. 60 is now dropped to a bit hmm. to 65%. That was obviously due to the grayscale selling off. Um, but then the other stats that are as bullish, if not more, 3%. So if you've held Bitcoin for over three years, 50% or almost 50% of the supply has not moved. Yeah. Um, so we're going into this asset that is just a pure play of just long-term hodling. Yeah. Um, or it is going to, towards it. And if you think on those three years, it's 2021 June. 
think about what's happened since 2021 June. Like we've had it started with the China mining ban in the summer, and then uh, you had the all time high in November, and then you had the biggest bear market, or in terms of events, lunar collapse, FTX collapse, and then you had a huge price appreciation in 2023, and people still weren't selling. So yeah, the, these these numbers are incredible to see. Um, so again, it, it's part of that bullish thesis. Yeah. Yeah, I really agree. I think it's it's very interesting to see that 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 percentage is very high. Like these people know what they are holding, right? And uh, that is more of a signal than short term <laughs> price movements of people who are still figuring out what this is. That's kind of like my thing there. Like uh, if you're selling, you don't understand it. If you're gambling, you don't understand it. You know, it's all fine, but that is what the short uh, short term price movement, in my opinion, is. Yeah, the I had a I did a debate with Jim Bianco um, oh, yeah. about the Bitcoin ETFs and understanding his side of it. Are the ETFs actually the end game? So all the boomers and that wealth just going into the ETFs and the ETFs are Bitcoin ETFs are part of the TradFi system, or are they actually um, a different uh, gateway into on-chain adoption? And I think they are that gateway to on-chain adoption, but I think you will, you will need catalysts along the way of people being like, great, the ETFs are easy to access, a uh, click of a button, black proper holding, I uh, trust them. But what happens if there is that event or I'm still holding my value kind of in US dollars where we're buying Bitcoin on-chain and we're keeping it in self-custody and it's okay, I have say one Bitcoin, and then I want to get to 1.5 Bitcoin. We're thinking in Bitcoin terms, where I think the ETF is still in that USD nominal value basis. Um, so I think they're the kind of difference. But yeah, I, again, I think it comes to education and learning, and that just takes so much time. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. I think, you know, ETFs are definitely a, a gateway because once you have it and you see your those ETFs outperform the rest of your portfolio, you know, whatever ETFs uh, else you have. You know, some people are going to be triggered or inclined to learn more and then they're going to figure out that they can actually own it, right? Um, but again, that that takes uh, that definitely takes time. Uh, people who are not holding it are, are those governments that I mentioned. It's super interesting to see that they are selling Bitcoin for a currency they can print. But what... Uh, what is your take on that? Do you see this as a as a huge uh, strategic mistake? Uh, in 2004, Gordon Brown, um, I believe he was the Chancellor of the United Kingdom at the time. He went on to become the Prime Minister, but I think he was the Chancellor at the time. He sold half our gold reserves. Um, and if you get the gold chart up and you point to where gold, Gordon Brown sold the gold reserves, it was at the bottom, like um, couldn't be more at the bottom. Wow. And why? what happened was that the market, I think, maybe knew that, you, that they were about to sell and drove the par price lower. So I can't remember what the price of gold was, but again, it would be an increment. It would be a significant amount that it was trading at X and then a few days before it was going to trade at Y. So we missed that percentage arbitrage. And again, the same thing probably happened again, that Governments are selling all those news, but the U.S. government only moved the Bitcoin to the CoinDesk, uh, the Coinbase Prime account. They haven't sold it; they moved it. So, like again, with the price, all people say, "All right, let's get the U.S. government to not get as much Bitcoin, or in terms of USD value, just to pull the price down a bit." Um, who knows why they're doing it? They still hold one percent of the supply, I believe, the U.S. government. German government holds the fifth most amount of Bitcoin, about 40, 45,000 Bitcoin. Um, do I think they're stupid? Yes. Um, I've learned to do exactly the opposite of governments and leaderships because I think they're all morons. Um, and especially that they can print a currency for nothing. Do I understand the motives? Not really. Um, if it is to raise essentially like tax receipts to pay for other debts, maybe mm. but no i don't understand 
the game, but governments, especially Western governments, don't have to think about the long-term implications. It's all about the short-term and the now and how can I raise capital, essentially. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to see to play out. I don't know how you view Bitcoin now, but I like the word entertaining. <laughs> you know, like I think we figured it this out up until some point, you know, and just seeing this play out is just super, super interesting. Um, yeah, and I have the same. I, I don't understand why you would be selling, you know, a 200 million euro amount or something like that, what Germany did. Well, you know, Ger- maybe Germany, they really need it, but I don't know. <laughs> every macro data I ever see coming out of Germany is just like economic depression levels. Hmm. So um, it must be to raise finances, probably is to raise finances. I don't, like, again, I spoke with Jim Bianco and I asked him about the Wisconsin pension fund. Um, I was like, are you surprised that they bought and he was like, no. I was like, why? He was like, these are well-capitalized, well-funded pension funds and they can have a long-term view. And I think governments, especially again, the Western short-term mindset, they don't have this long-term thought process. Rishi Sunak, for example, in the UK, we've got an election next week. We hold 60,000 Bitcoin again. Would I be surprised if the UK government sold? No. Like, yeah. one, they probably have no idea the value of it in the long term. But two, again, it's to raise finances. So I, no, I don't blame governments. So yeah. They're as stupid as it, uh, as the most stupid person comes across. Um, but no, that's where we are, really. I think it's it's also kind of poetic. Let's say Germany is selling just to change, you know, the deficit from something, something billion and then minus something. 200 million just to change one number in 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 in, in one <laughs> you yeah, know that gets the votes that gets the votes well then they can say you know we reduce the deficit by something something right but but 10 years from now which is a blip in the age of uh, a, a country right yeah i wonder what that's going to be worth so i uh, i i yeah, it's just really interesting to follow yeah um I saw one of your tweets uh, that said, and you just mentioned it, you know, two theories I believe will get destroyed this Bitcoin cycle. One, we'll see an all-time high before the halving. Well, we saw that. And two is diminishing returns. Can you elaborate a bit on the diminishing returns? Um, Because you think we won't see them, right? The theory of diminishing returns is that the the returns will be, be less. Like, so the first epoch was like, I don't know, 20,000%-ish, um, and yeah. it's lower every epoch. Yeah, I, I, look, I don't think we're going to get to epoch one returns, but in terms of my theory on, I think we, I can't remember what the returns were of the previous cycle, but we will beat that. That's what I believe. Um, or we will get very close, but the, the fundamental basis of the, the theory was ETF demand, uh, inflation, uh chaos in in countries uh in governments um and i do think uh this this epoch cycle um i think everyone is very underprepared for what is happening i think there's going to be a huge spike in unemployment i think there's going to be a huge surge in global liquidity um and some assets benefit from that global liquidity and not all so um if we've got rising unemployment um, I, I, it's a bit like COVID. I think this is we're going to be in these this long four years essentially of just uncertain inflation. We look, we could get inflation that doesn't come back down to two percent, and we've seen Australia, Canada um, report CPI inflation prints higher than the previous month. Canada already started cutting, so. That's the inflation uncertainty. Look, we could get inflation and it goes below the 2% and it doesn't stop at 2%. It just continues to go down and we get that deflation. But that that deflation adds to this chaos. Um, so if we get this kind of chaos, it then adds that global liquidity and because that's what yeah. central banks and governments know what to do is just give out free money. And Bitcoin is that asset that is closest um, to the global liquidity indicator. Um, I think bonds 
and real estate are going to get hit the hardest. And I think even 1% of that money that goes out of bonds and real estate, and we're talking two, $300 trillion worth of assets in those two, just to find a few million Bitcoin just floating about. Yeah, that's kind of how the theory plays out for the next four years. Yeah. That's a very rational approach. I think even 1%, 1 is very um, it's very low, right? It would make sense for people to to diversify. And I agree that the, the trust in, in, in bonds will not go up when when the governments of the, the issuers of those bonds are printing their own currency, right? Like that's uh, that's not yeah. gonna happen. The the, the 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 citizens are going to demand a higher yield and obviously we can't get a higher yield because of the debt levels it will just mm. implode the bonds or the, the debt system um and we're seeing with australia their their bond yields have just absolutely skyrocketed off that inflation print and everyone was calling for rate cuts this year we started at seven rate cuts i don't think and i still said buy it i don't think we'll get any and if we do get, it means something has fundamentally broken in the system. It will be a high, it will be a higher for longer until something breaks. Why? Because the last 13 recessions or so, 11 of them have resulted in a, in a Fed hiking cycle. 11 of them have involved a recession. And because the system is a complete Ponzi scheme in the simplest way to put it, and there's no way out. So that again, that's part of the thesis, really. Yeah, it's just yeah probabilities at this point. Yeah, like doing nothing is also doing something, right? So not raising, not lowering. You know, that doesn't mean that you're kicking the can down the road. Like there are still effects from that, or at least perception from people that would, you know, or or other countries that would usually buy, um, uh, uh, buy buy your bonds as well. Yeah. It, yeah, it's it's interesting to see what's going to happen and we can see it kind of starting out now with the Japan Japanese yen going through 160. They hold over 1 trillion dollars worth of uh US treasuries. Um biggest buyer of US treasuries, bigger than China, bigger than the United Kingdom and how are they going to defend their currency? Yes, they've got a few other war chests they can use, but the US treasuries are the biggest ones that they've got in their disposal. And that's going to send the US yields even higher. Um, the US are issuing so much debt in terms of short-term debt, three months, six months, um, because there are buyers right in front, um, but nothing at the, the longer end, because that's obviously going to blow everything else up, mortgages, housing, pensions. Um, but so that I will stop gonna... the market also, you mean? Yeah. Right. There's just not enough, in my opinion, there's not enough buyers for 30 year bonds. Like yeah. you're not going to sit there and, and buy them. You'll buy them at the three month and the six month. Um, but yeah, it, it, the, this geopolitical uncertainty um, with these currencies, it's just, it, it, it's so hard to even get your head around the, the idea. Um, and you wake up thinking it all can't really be true, but it, it really is. Yeah. So, do you think Bitcoin is a is a, is a is a risky asset or not? No. Um, well, it depends. Um, it trades as a risk on asset. Mm. It's a. It, I can say. At times, it has correlations to the stock market, but again, this correction, Bitcoin's corrected and stocks have gone to the all time high, so there's no correlation there. Um, it depends your your viewpoint and your solvency. So I always advocate if you buy Bitcoin, you have to have a four year time horizon minimum because any moment that you've bought Bitcoin and you've held it for four years, you are up. So from that perspective, no, it's not risky. But as long as you have that cash balance and you are generating an income, um, I don't see it as risky, especially in the long term, because when I look at the pension system, um, the I think the pension system in the UK is over like 110% GDP. Like there's there's more money in the pension system than there is actually going on for the economy. It doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. 
there's too many people taking it out that are putting in. Um, and if we know really what's, what may or may not happen to the currency or anything like that, that yes, you're going to want this asset outside of the system that you can take full sovereignty over. Yeah. So I think from a short term perspective, if you don't have the right mindset and the right capital, it's extremely risky. Um, then you will have to liquidate your Bitcoin. But if you take a, I guess, a Bitcoin mentality, I think it's, it's more risk off than, than anything I've ever seen. Yeah. It's funny. I always say like, I'm, I'm a pretty risk averse person, but, uh, I'm, uh, I'm like 90 plus percent in Bitcoin, I think, because for me, it's kind of like, what's the alternative? Like all the other alternatives, at least for me or the understanding I have of them are all riskier than, than Bitcoin. And yes, I agree. You know, this short term price volatility, I do feel that still, um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I just understand what this is and it, it just makes more sense than all the alternatives. So yeah, yeah I'm just sticking it, with this. But the title of your podcast is Bitcoin for Millennials. Um, I'm Gen Z. Um, I'm like at the very bottom end of Millennials, beginning of Gen Z. And for me to go and buy a property, I'd have to put myself in half a million pounds worth of debt in London at minimum. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a shocking property. Like same gonna, here, same here. Yeah, it's going to be horrendous, and yeah. I can't imagine that is financially sensible for anyone to put themselves into half a million pounds worth of debt. I know people that do it. I know people my age that have done it, and I've sat down with them, saying, "Just rent, see where the market goes." Um, again, I think real estate is in the biggest. With this real estate bubble is one of the biggest bubbles of all time. So just wait, see what happens. Um, and in the meantime, grow your income and save some Bitcoin um, because you're not, what people have just not done in property and, the, and the, how I've seen it as they copy their parents and because it worked for their parents, they think it will work for them. Their parents were on honestly very similar wages um, on average, but the house was worth a 50th of the price. Um, the wage to house prices were two, three X. It's now 12, 15 X. People just haven't worked out that one, if you're buying a house, when will you be able to afford to pay it off? Not even in terms of uh, selling your Bitcoin, selling your investments, just from a, a wage perspective. Um, and then secondly, when you're buying a house, and in the UK, I don't know about uh, the Netherlands, but we're on short-term variable rates not the same as the US. So the US have a, you buy a house on a 30 year fix. Mm. In the UK, you're on a two or five year fix essentially. So really, yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I think, um, the UK property market has a world of pain ahead of it. So in COVID, you could buy a house at 0% or even before COVID rates were at zero, you could buy rates 1%, 1.5%, 2%, nothing. But now rates are at five and a quarter percent. They're, they're, they're historically average. So 5% is the historical average since 1955. But what we're now seeing is people have to try and buy a house with 6 7%. And it's, they can't do it because the wages haven't gone up. But what people haven't done is even on a 4 or 5% interest rate, how much of the mortgage are you paying off against how much interest you're paying off? And no one does the math on that. They just think I'm going to get on the property ladder. I'm going to buy. I'm going to, yeah. It's an asset. Um, but, but people haven't done it. There are these, um, there are these help to buy schemes that the UK government introduced 10, 15 years ago. I think kind of in the aftermath of the global financial crisis to prop up the housing market. Instead of making it more affordable, they made it obviously more unaffordable. And the idea of the scheme was um, it was to put, for my generation, to put 5% uh, of your income down on a £600,000 property in London. Um, and then the, the bank, you then have to take a mortgage out against the bank and then a mortgage out against the government. So you're essentially got two mortgages on one property and these properties are new builds. So the flat probably 
well, the building's probably worth 400,000, say, but because it's brand new, they could charge a markup to 600,000 and you only have to put 5% down, which is what, 30, 35,000 pounds. But the, the, the idea is you have to pay the mortgage to the bank and then the government. Wow. And if you haven't sold the property within five years, you then have to start paying that second mortgage to the government. And then I was reading the details literally the last few weeks. Um, they stopped the scheme, by the way, of like last year because they've realized interest rates are high. This is, this is going to blow the whole thing. Um, there's, you, I, 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 I can't go into the details because it's so specific, but you could end up paying, honestly, about a 10% mortgage rate on these two government, on this government loan and the bank loan on a property that you just can't afford anyway. Mm. Um, and it, it's just the education system has just failed, just completely failed. Um, so when people say Bitcoin is a scam, all the FUD in the world, I'll ask them questions, even like how many blocks does Bitcoin produce in a Anything, just really simple, no idea. But getting yourself in half a million pounds worth of debt, it's yeah, like no questions asked. Yeah, yeah. So that was a bit of a ramble on. I no, no, I love, was. I love that. I uh, yeah. I was also thinking what the question was. No, the the question was the, what was the title of the podcast, millennials, and from a Gen Z, that was kind of how I saw Bitcoin as that apex store of value. I was like, okay. How can I do what my parents did um, and live in a property essentially and or have these properties, rent them out and grow their wealth? All right, property's finished. Stocks uh, maybe is a viable option, but that means I have to watch CNBC all day and become an amazing stock trader. Yeah. Gold is, is useless, um, suppressed and doesn't tie into the digital world. Art, oh, I have no understanding of. Wine, cigars. Again, it's too niche for me. So what was the other play? It was this risky thing called crypto. And it, it then became Bitcoin. And I do believe every generation has this one asset to take advantage of. And it, it is more obvious than not that it is Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, I think the not thinking about it, but still doing it, still participating in this system uh, I, I shared that many times already on the podcast, but that was one of my biggest triggers when someone explained to me, you know, did you know the money in the bank is not yours? W while I was yeah. working at a bank, actually, and having, well, work, work, having, yeah. having a mortgage. And I was like, okay, I'm participating in this, but I have no clue how it works. That kind of sent me more down down the rabbit hole. But yeah, I actually, I actually have friends who bought place for like 540,000 euros, 60 square feet, some apartments from the eighties, just because they could, you know, there's the, they had a really nice rental apartment. Like I don't, I'm, I'm not even going to start the conversation, but I think it's just really fascinating that, that people are doing these things without thinking. And then, yeah, if you introduce and I, you know, that that's also why Bitcoin, I think is hard to understand. It's just a totally different paradigm. Like it's, it, it's just a different different thing you know it's not real estate property it's digital property <laughs> you know like it's it's just a different thing but i i think the main thing as you mentioned is that gen z millennials should understand that they cannot do the same thing as their parents did it, yeah you know, it's the, it. it's pre-internet and post-internet and if you're doing a job that isn't really involving the internet okay we can have that we could have a discussion on ai and it could take um white collar jobs okay that's one separate issue but yes you have to do be doing something completely different to your parents and um, be taking full advantage of the internet um, which i don't think enough people are really doing and um, bitcoin is an asset that you can't really generate yield from or you can't generate yield uh, we, we've seen in certain aspects in 2022 uh, you lend these companies your bitcoin you get 10% they blow up because they're a Ponzi scheme. But maybe when at some point these companies are fully collateralized or over collateralized and you can lend your Bitcoin out and get the and get a yield on it or borrow against it, that could even open up a bigger market. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as the moment Bitcoin is just this thing 
that can't generate yield on it, um, which I think is really appealing to the boomer generation because they've relied on doing absolutely nothing for 40 years and just gener- and getting something in return for nothing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it flips kind of the economics and financial system on its head. Yeah. And you just mentioned you're like a late millennial, early Gen Z. Uh, how do you experience then talking about Bitcoin with your friends or the friends that, that you sat down with? Like, how, how does that no, go? No, I've given up. It's really? no point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to a couple of years ago when I, but I care, but it's, um, it's just too much energy. Um, and the ones that are interested do message me and want to learn more and everything like that. And that's great, but I'm not going to waste my energy on people that don't want to learn or like they don't want to learn. That's absolutely fine. Um, and that's it. I think, um, I think the younger generation, even below me, I think they're going to have an even harder time. Um, I think the AI introduction is going to be very wave, uh, deflationary on wages. Um, so I think it's going to be hard for them, but my, I'm thankful in a way that, yeah, I didn't get the, the luxury of being able to buy, uh, buy a, a house for $20,000, but I was born at the right time to understand and accumulate as much Bitcoin as I could. Yeah. And so we, we do see some, uh, some companies adopting Bitcoin, you know, after uh, MicroStrategy, of course, there's a company called Semler Scientific in America that followed like MetaPlanet in, in Japan. W- what are your thoughts on this? Do you see this evolve? Some people say like MicroStrategy is like a one and done, like no one can, can follow that playbook anymore, but we see some attempts though. I think my strategy in terms of the accumulation that they've got is a one and done. No, there is no one of it going to be able to accumulate over 200,000 Bitcoin um, at a cost basis of $35,000 uh, publicly traded. Um, so that's, yeah, in that respect, they are one and done. But in terms of this trend that's going on, and this is something that I've been really keen to learn more about, this is a trend that's going to carry on. Um, and the conversations that I can imagine happening in boardrooms, that they're all discussing why my share price is absolutely tanking through the floor. Why is Michael Saylor and his zombie company generating $12 billion of profit a year, his share price going through the absolute roof? Why is he getting all the interest? Why is he getting all the media coverage? Um, and I think there are... Um, dynamics going on that I think companies are ready to deploy. Uh, I spoke to DeFi Technologies this week, the Canadian publicly traded company that bought Bitcoin uh, in the past few weeks, their share price has gone through the roof. They had to wait until they were in a, uh, a, a profitable place to buy, but they've understood Bitcoin for years. Um, so that's also another reason. Um, but yeah, this trend is really encouraging. I think it will go hand in hand with the 13 F islands that we're going to see. These institutions move extremely slowly. So if you said to me, and I had this discussion this week, if we saw no more 13 F filings on the size of Wisconsin state pension fund and no more publicly traded companies uh, adopting Bitcoin as a treasury asset, would I be surprised? And I would be, yes, I'd be extremely surprised. No. I am. Uh, I was just googling when are the next ones due. So, thirteen F filing is filing that's mandatory, um, mandated by the SEC, right? Where companies disclose their holdings of. Is it like other assets than their own stocks, or it's, just in it's, general? It's, like, it's. I think it's. Uh, if the I believe it's the company that holds more than a hundred million dollars of assets, they yeah. have to disclose it. I believe that's the number yeah. and yeah, it starts in July, finishes around August. Um, so this is going to be the, the, the big narrative for the next coming months. This is the next one, right? I see quickly reading 45 days after the closing of a quarter. So that would be like mid August or something. We would see the next yeah. uh, filings of those. Yeah. All right. Um, well, talking about companies, uh, we saw Michael Dell tweet uh, 
some cryptic <laughs> stuff. What what do you think about that? I mean, uh, Dell has been accepting Bitcoin as one of the first big companies actually for ver- for a very long time. He is the 10 or 12th richest person in the world. Um, majority shareholder. So do you have any thoughts about Michael Dell and Dell uh, perhaps adopting? So, well, I can put it really, really simply. I bought Dell shares as soon as the, the Cookie Monster tweet came out. <laughs> put it that way. Um, yeah. I, was on, I was on the bandwagon of buying uh, similar scientific stock, bandwagon of DeFi technologies. I couldn't get access to MetaPlanet. Um, because this trend was the, the, the equities market were repricing these stocks higher, um, which is an unbelievable trend to see. Um, again, even with these Bitcoin miners, we're now starting to see them being repriced from an AI perspective. So it seems like the equities market is really liking Bitcoin. Um, so Dell and Michael Dell make Michael Saylor and Michael Strachey look extremely poor. Um, Michael Dell and Dell, I think he has about $7 billion cash on hand. Um, I think he's a majority shareholder, which is extremely important, like Michael Saylor. And the work has already been done beforehand. I can guarantee you that because he's not going to stop tweeting some stupid cookie monster picture. Um, yeah. So yeah, he knows the score. Sailors did the same tweet, so they've obviously spoken as well. And it's all about allocating at the right time. Um, you don't want to buy too high because you'll look like an idiot. You don't want to buy too... So um, they're going to find this happy medium. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I do expect a, an announcement from Dell. I don't know. Again, maybe the, yeah, by the end of this year. All right. Let's uh, let's wrap up with some uh, with some speculative questions. Are there any big surprises you would expect this cycle? Any any uh, thoughts that are out there? The the Ethereum ETF. I know it's not about Bitcoin, but the Ethereum ETF approval was a surprise. Um, but I think tying it back into Bitcoin, um, it, w- it was only a, it was only approved obviously because of the CME futures. It's not a commodity, obviously. Yeah. Um, obviously. Um, but it's political opportunism, yes. Political, and I think that's really important moving into this election cycle with Trump being a huge proponent. Yes, we don't know really his fundamental viewpoint on Bitcoin, but let's take it as a pinch of salt. Um, we're starting to see, um, I think, some other news. Um, I can't remember specifically, but I think politically it's favoring crypto and Bitcoin. I think maybe the attraction is going there. Um, the Dems, the Democrats against the Republicans. There's also that kind of um, jostling for position in crypto. So I didn't think a Bitcoin election would have happened this cycle. I thought maybe next next election, maybe 2028, when these two old people have gone. But I think to show that Bitcoin is at the forefront of this election cycle, and I think the debate is this week or next week. So there's going to be a few crypto questions. Um, so yeah, that was a, that's a huge surprise. Yeah, I agree. I uh, I also wanted to ask you like your thoughts on the, on that Bitcoin topic, but yeah, it is a big surprise. I also don't know, you know, the, what is the full understanding of Trump. But eventually, I you know, it doesn't really matter. Like Bitcoin doesn't need politicians. Apparently, the politicians need Bitcoin as a talking point. Just that by itself is already. Uh, very interesting and just like the the quick and dirty reaction by the democrats you know with approving ETH etf um just shows you that in 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 some way there's weight to bitcoin slash crypto in general uh th- the fact that it's mentioned is uh bizarre actually i don't know how else to put it but yeah let's see let's see how that goes i think uh uh, you know, this podcast will be out later, but it's this week, the week of uh, June uh, 27. I think that's when the debate is, or it's next week. So when this is out, the debate I think is it's, I think it's today. I actually think it's really? today. Yeah. Okay. Well, then uh, we have to pay attention. Um, yeah. Just interesting. Again, it's entertaining. It's interesting. Let's see how that goes. 
Um, last speculation question. What's your idea about global game theory? Like my money is on a serious like Arab country adopting Bitcoin and that will kind of like kick off dominoes. But uh, do you have any ideas? The, I think just looking at like Marathon Digital Holdings, um, they made some serious headwinds with uh, sovereign nations, Kenya, UAE. These kind of mm, announcements are huge. Um, not, again, not just from pure Bitcoin, but from a mining exposure and uh, the good news that mining does do, you can obviously use it with stranded and uh, unused, un untapped energy. So these announcements are huge. Um, I think also with the hash rate resilience is a great indicator of sovereign nations are mining. Um, but yes, we, it does take that. Look, I think if Dell and maybe another nation like an Argentina or Brazil come into Bitcoin, I think yes, that's, I think game theory is pretty much one there. So yeah, I think we're one publicly traded company and one sovereign nation away from flipping over to yeah, now take us seriously yeah all right last question to wrap up and i ask everyone the same question which is totally unrelated to a q3 uh, <laughs> outlook but it is what is a core belief you will never let go core belief that i will never let go um it's it's i think it's like it's like good karma and treat people with respect how you'd want to be treated. Because I think, uh, especially within the community, uh, it goes a long way. Uh, such a small space. Everyone's so passionate and wants to work their way up and everyone wants to help each other. And I just think I've seen the trap fly space and I've seen how pretty disgusting it is and how everyone wants to tramp away from each other to get to the top. I think that core belief which is everyone wins and that's the mentality that we need to have we're all in it together it's a greater purpose yeah well fiat is a zero sum game and bitcoin is a mutually <laughs> beneficial game so uh true yeah. thanks for sharing man and 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 thanks for this update maybe we can do it again i think it was fun and uh yeah man i appreciate you coming on i will link to your twitter in the show notes so people can follow you and uh yeah man thank you Cheers. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.